Hi everybody, this is Steve from TrustVote.tv. Today I'm reading An Electoral System in Crisis, a new paper by Lulu Friesdott and Anselmo Sampietro, written in collaboration with Fritz Scheuren and Election Justice USA. This is from July 18th, 2016. Having confidence in our elections is central to our faith in our government and all of the decisions that we make collectively as a nation. But are the candidates who win the ones we actually vote for? A large and growing body of research provides convincing evidence that U.S. electronic voting equipment in many areas throughout the country is not counting the votes accurately. This could be due to malfunctions in computer equipment that in 43 states is over a decade old and long past its natural life. However, in many cases, the evidence strongly suggests that fraud is the likely explanation. These problems have been occurring since at least 2004 and are certainly present in the current 2016 presidential primaries. The documentation consists of statistical graphs analyzing data from five presidential cycles, as well as off-year races from across the country. The data illustrates that there are unusually large discrepancies between small precinct and large precinct election returns and noticeable differences between hand-counted and machine-counted precinct results. Even in isolation, the data give cause for concern. The statistical evidence is reinforced by physical evidence and congressional hearings, manual recounts that do not match the totals of the machines being audited, and testimony under oath about direct knowledge of tampering with electronic voting equipment. We examined the election results of the 2016 presidential primaries and found irregularities in the overwhelming majority of the 21 states that we analyzed. The data indicates, in particular, that the totals reported in the Democratic race between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders may not be correct. In state after state, Independent examination by two separate analysts found suspect statistical patterns giving Clinton inflated percentages that in all likelihood are not fully based on actual votes and leaving Sanders with what appear to be artificially depressed totals. The difference between the reported totals and our best estimate of the actual vote totals varies considerably from state to state. However, these differences are significant, sometimes more than 10%, and could change the outcome of the 2016 Democratic presidential primary. We found irregularities in the 2016 Republican presidential primary as well, and while concerning, we do not believe that they are large enough to change the outcome of that race. Fritz Scheuren, a member of the statistics faculty at George Washington University and a former president of the American Statistical Association, has been a collaborator in this research. Examining the data from the study, Scheuren said, As a statistician, I find the results of the 2016 primary voting unusual. In fact, I found the patterns unexpected and possibly even suspicious. There is a greater degree of smoothness in the outcomes than the roughness that is typical in raw, real data. It is important to note that the fact that a candidate benefits from irregularities does not imply that a candidate is responsible for them. In January 2014, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration published a report stating, perhaps the most dire warning the Commission heard in its investigation concerned the impending crisis in voting technology. Well known to election administrators, if not the public at large, this impending crisis arises from the widespread wearing out of voting machines purchased a decade ago. This report was issued over two years ago, but unfortunately, very little has been done since then to rectify the problem. So the issues we are reporting here of security problems on old and failing machines are not surprising. However, we did find security issues with even newer electronic voting equipment, such as the machines in New York State. At a congressional briefing on voter suppression held on April 21, 2016, Representative Hank Johnson, Democrat of Georgia, expressed grave concern about the security of the voting equipment. There is a very insidious, treacherous, and deceitful method of voter suppression, and it has to do with the integrity of the voting process itself. One possibility, and I think it's a very good one, is that someone's manipulating the counting of the votes. Someone is hacking into these computers that tabulate the votes. End quote. An environment of corruption. 
the portrait of an electoral system in crisis is further supported by reports from election integrity organizations, media outlets, and individuals on social media that voting is increasingly taking place in a corrupt environment. This contextual evidence of voters purged from the rolls, registrations lost in the mail, party registrations being changed without a voter's knowledge or intent, voters being sent incorrect ballots, a shortage of ballots, polling places being closed, discouragingly long lines in targeted precincts and states, and disturbingly large disparities between initial exit polls and official results lends credence to the argument that if one form of fraud is already in play, another form of fraud is more plausible. This information is being aggregated by election integrity groups such as Election Justice USA through voter testimonials and lawsuits that are in progress around the country. Figures 1 and 1A are examples of disenfranchised voters from the 2016 presidential primaries. Stories like these have been ubiquitous in many states, including Arizona, New York, and California. More of these instances are documented in this article on heavy.com. How would we know if the voting machines were not counting the votes correctly? The best way to check would be to count the ballots by hand or examine any paper or electronic trail available in a thorough and public audit. This is not happening. According to a database compiled by Citizens for Election Integrity, only 12 states require a post-election audit of every contest and ballot issue voted on the ballot. Even that estimate is generous. For example, New York is listed as one of those 12 states, but in 2015, its post-election audit law was changed from requiring a 3% hand count audit to simply running those ballots through the machine again. Alan Goldston, a New York election law consultant, said, this is not a recount at all. So the short answer to this question is, we wouldn't know if the totals were wrong. Or would we? Would there be other indications that the machine count is not accurate? Evidence. If voting machine results were inaccurate on a regular basis, there would be some evidence of it. One indicator would be that votes counted by machines would give different results than votes counted by hand. In fact, this is now being seen in elections all over the country. In the 2016 Democratic primary in Kings County, New York, which is Brooklyn, a group of affidavit ballots were hand counted by a group of volunteers. Comparing the hand counts with the machine counts, there is a noticeable difference as seen in Figure 2. In every single assembly district we examined, except one, Hillary Clinton performed better when the votes were counted by machine. This is a small sample of the overall ballots cast, but the consistency of the results makes a convincing case that something is amiss. Figure 2 shows how hand-counted ballots show a consistently higher return for Sanders in the 2016 New York presidential primary. Comparisons have been made previously between voting results in hand-counted precincts and machine-counted precincts. While there have been discrepancies, they have been passed off as the result of demographics. This is a reasonable concern since it is possible that voters of a particular political perspective could tend to choose a particular type of voting equipment. However, in this instance, because the two sample sets, hand counted and machine counted, are from identical precincts with voters participating in the same election on the same day, there is no demographic variable to take into account. These affidavit ballots are from voters who were not able to vote by regular ballot. In the New York 2016 primary, over 120,000 voters were purged from the rolls in Brooklyn alone. And a large number of voters also had their voter registration changed without their knowledge or intent. Sanders voters tend to be younger and more independent, so one might think that they would be less likely to register ahead of time and more likely to show up in the affidavit sample. However, of the over 120,000 affidavit ballots cast, only about 30,000 were actually certified and counted. It is that final approved subset being counted in our study. Those votes would have only included officially registered Democrats, not independents or late registrants. Those officially approved affidavit votes, when counted by hand, are showing a consistently higher percentage for Sanders than when the votes are counted by machine. There are two possible explanations for this. One is that the machines are counting the votes differently. 
The other is that the voters who were forced to use affidavit ballots were targeted Sanders voters. Possibly, both of these factors are at work. Either way, the data indicates the footprint of manipulation in the election and calls into question the validity of the reported results. Figure 2A shows the results of a recount in Hillsborough County in the 2008 New Hampshire Democratic primary. There were differences in almost every precinct between the original machine count and the manual recount. In the 2016 Wisconsin and Massachusetts presidential primaries, there have also been stark differences between the candidates' percentages in hand count and machine count precincts. The examples provided above showing differences between hand counts and machine counts cannot be explained by demographics. If the discrepancies are not due to demographics, there is either some issue with the voting machines or the hand counts. Information surrounding those two protocols suggests that the problem would be with the machines and not the hand counts. In his well-researched post on the odd results of the 2016 Massachusetts Democratic primary, Theodore de Macedo Suarez points out that Canada, Australia, Denmark, France, Ireland, Italy, Sweden, and Spain are among the 59 countries that rely on hand-counted paper ballots to determine their results. In contrast, concerns about security and accuracy have plagued electronic voting machines wherever they have been implemented. In 2009, Germany's highest court banned the use of computers in the voting process amidst concerns that the process was not transparent. Jonathan Simon, a Harvard-educated attorney who is the co-director of the Election Defense Alliance, says on his website, There's virtual unanimity among the experts who have studied electronic voting machines that insiders or hackers can change the results of elections without leaving a trace. He cites studies from Johns Hopkins, Princeton, University of Michigan, the Brennan Center for Social Justice at NYU, the states of California and Ohio, and even the U.S. Government Accountability Office to back up his claim. J. Alex Halderman teaches computer and network security at the University of Michigan and has successfully compromised numerous voting systems. He paints a vivid and unnerving description of one hack. Within 36 hours of the system going live, he says, our team had almost total control of the server software, including the ability to change votes and reveal voters' secret ballots. Halderman points out that the threat to our elections could be coming from political players inside our country or even from abroad. Testifying before the D.C. Board of Ethics and Elections about one of his many voting machine hacks, Halderman makes it clear that the risks are not theoretical. While we were in control of these systems, we observed other attack attempts originating from computers in Iran and China. These attackers were attempting to guess the same master password that we did, and since it was only four letters long, they would likely have soon succeeded. You can view Dr. Halderman performing a successful hack on a voting machine in this clip from the documentary Hollerback, Not Voting in an American Town. We have had election fraud. There's a lot at stake. Control of the American government, control of the economy, control of the military. When there's a lot at stake, there's an incentive to fraud. The difference between our history of fraud and computerized fraud is that with computerized fraud, you can set up a program that basically gives you the number of votes you need, switches, deletes, adds, without leaving a trace. Computer professionals pretty much agree that the system is tremendously vulnerable. I'm Alex Halderman. I'm a graduate student at Princeton University. I'm Ari Feldman, and I'm also a graduate student at Princeton University. My interests are computer security and technology policy. This machine has two locks, one that covers both the power switch and the memory card slot. And the memory card slot is really all that's needed to um, introduce malicious software on the machine. Who is responsible? At this point, we're unable to say who might be responsible for any data breaches to the voting equipment. There could be any number of independent players who would benefit from the victory of a particular candidate and would be willing to take action to influence the results.
Our research also indicates that in some elections, the footprint of more than one unofficial player is evident. What is that pattern? We are now going to utilize a different technique in our search for evidence of election result irregularities. We will focus primarily on statistical irregularities, and by that we mean results that defy statistical laws. The technique we are using is called the Cumulative Precinct Vote Tally Chart, also known as a CVT, Cumulative Vote Tally Graph, or CVS, Cumulative Vote Study. The CVT graph has a number of advantages in examining election results. Exit polls and the discrepancies between them and the official results have received a lot of attention in the 2016 presidential cycle. The CVT graph uses actual votes and not post-vote surveys, so the results are more conclusive than exit poll comparisons. Secondly, although it is based on solid statistical protocols, it does not require statistical training to understand and is therefore suited to helping both the statistical and non-statistical community fully grasp the large distance between the vote totals currently being reported and the statistical norm. Third, statistician Beth Clarkson explains that election data tends to have a lot of noise. She likes the CVT analysis because it allows you to see a trend that is difficult to spot in a noisy data set. The technique is based on the law of large numbers, see figure 3. Investopedia provides a straightforward explanation. A principle of probability and statistics which states that as a sample size grows, its mean will get closer and closer to the average of the whole population. Interpreting this law for elections, the sample size is the number of votes and the mean is the candidate's percentage. In practice, what happens is that the larger a sample of votes that you collect, the closer you should get to the candidate's average percentage of support in that locale. This is easy to see in action. If you and your friends support a candidate, it does not mean the candidate has that level of support overall. But a broader sample of voters in your community will generate a more accurate picture of the candidate's actual level of support. This is the basic concept behind all polling, and this is the principle that is the foundation for the CVT graphs. Using CVT graphs to demonstrate irregularities in election results has been controversial. As a result, we're going to relay the methodology and backstory of the technique, confirm that it accurately demonstrates a statistical pattern that exists, investigate whether there is a demographic explanation for that pattern, and explore what, if anything, the pattern signifies. The CVT graph shows the precincts added together cumulatively from the smallest to the largest along the x-axis. On the y-axis, it shows the two candidates' percentages. In these instances, from 2000 and 2004, the CVT graph resembles the graph illustrating the law of large numbers. Because the precincts are added together cumulatively as you move further right on the graph, it becomes harder and harder for any individual precinct to overcome the average percentage of all the votes that have been added up so far, and the data tends to chart as a flat line. At least it did until 2004. Sometime around 2004, or possibly a little earlier, other patterns emerge that we will discuss shortly. You may be surprised to see some of the above graphs credited to Liberty 1789. One of the reasons for the controversy surrounding the CVT graph is that it was developed on the Internet by non-professionals outside of academic statistical circles by forum users posting under pseudonyms. You couldn't really ask for a worse start for a statistical method to be taken seriously. The graph was first used in 2012 by a group of Ron Paul supporters who had strong analytical and engineering skills. The first formal presentation of the technique was made by two of those Ron Paul supporters, Choquette and Johnson, in two online papers. But according to Choquette, the idea of charting the precincts from the smallest to the largest was conceived by an engineer named Phil Evans, who used the online handle the man. Evans remembers the night he first started to notice an unusual pattern in the election returns. In 2012, he says, I was watching CNN report on the GOP primary results in New Hampshire, and what struck me was that Ron Paul received double the percent in small precincts as in large. I wondered what that could be. Evans designs and builds industrial machinery, and his work involves complex data analysis. 
he became fascinated with the question, why would one candidate get such a larger percentage of the votes in the large precincts? After studying the data intensively for six weeks, Evans came to a conclusion that stunned him, but also made sense. He became convinced that in the large precincts, some of the candidates' votes were being shifted to another candidate. Why only in the large precincts? It would be easier to disguise the differences, he thought. In the small precincts, with only a few voters, the shift would be much more noticeable. There were at least two ways it could be done through software in the machines, or through the software used when the totals were centrally tabulated. He wanted to illustrate the vote switching he believed was occurring. He says, Six weeks later, I had figured out a method for expressing this using Excel and released a paper that is still online today. Evans says his initial graphs from that paper were modified by another forum user, Liberty1789, into the cumulative precinct vote tally chart. Evans and his fellow Ron Paul supporters began using it to graph many of the election results of the 2012 Republican primary. Here is the pattern they saw in state after state. A candidate receives a higher percentage of votes in large precincts than he or she receives in small precincts. This increase occurs in mathematically proportionate pattern. In other words, as the precincts get larger, the candidate's support gets larger at the expense of other candidates. Often, this increase is enough to change the outcome or the dynamic of the election. Which candidate receives increased support in larger precincts depends on the particular race. In 2012, the candidate that benefited from the pattern in almost every race was Mitt Romney. After Ron Paul lost the election, Evans suspected that Paul had been cheated. Evans says, It was frustrating because he was giving speeches in large venues with thousands lined up outside beyond capacity, while the other candidates were somewhat lonely. It didn't make sense to Evans, but he had no way to prove that Paul's votes had been stolen. In the fall of 2012, Choquette and Johnson wrote up the findings of the forum and circulated their papers widely on the Internet and via email. In those papers, they occasionally used the word alleged, but for the most part, they made bold claims like, when candidate Mick Romney is on the ballot, he always gains votes through vote flipping. And, this document exposes what may very well be the greatest case of election fraud ever to occur in U.S. history. They sparked considerable discussion within the election reform community. However, their study was received in the statistical community with understandable skepticism. The most obvious flaw in Choquette and Johnson's paper is their claim that Democratic Party elections, quote, don't show this problem. It turns out that there are many Democratic Party elections that exhibit this pattern, too. However, despite this weakness, their statistical graphs have been confirmed to be accurate in three separate studies. Each of these found more elections where the pattern appears. We asked Kelly Odeboni, a graduate student at UC Berkeley, to confirm the accuracy of the graphs in all three of these studies, and she replicated and confirmed the accuracy of one graph each of Clarkson, the Nebraska High School Scientific Logic class, and two of Mark Lindemann's graphs. Beth Clarkson, who conducted one of the studies, is a quality control engineer with a doctorate in statistics. She read Choquette and Johnson's paper and tested their technique herself on a number of elections. In the elections Clarkson examined in Kansas, Ohio, and Wisconsin, she found the same unusual increase for one candidate in the large precincts. As a statistician, she found the results terribly surprising. Clarkson published an article in the statistical journal Significance, affirming both of the study's analysis and conclusions, saying, The data I've analyzed supports their hypothesis that we have a serious, pervasive, and systematic problem with electronic voting machines. She is currently suing Kansas election officials for permission to audit the paper trail of one of the elections she analyzed in order to compare the machine's paper records with the recorded results. So far, her audit has not been permitted, and she remains concerned. If fraud were occurring, she says, these are the kind of patterns we would expect to see. Clarkson discovered that the statistical patterns and a candidate's percentage of the vote share vary between different models of electronic voting equipment. She also found 
that there were statistical irregularities favoring more than one candidate, leading her to surmise, the manipulation is not limited to a single powerful operator. My assessment is that the data reveals multiple, as in at least two, agents working independently to successfully alter voting results. Here in Figure 6, the ESNS DS200 vote scanner shows an irregular statistical pattern that favors Romney, red dots. But the ESNS DS100 and the Hart eScan show an irregular pattern that favors Obama, which is the blue lines. Clarkson is graphing the percentages as they impact the Republican vote. So when a line is going up, it is favoring the Republican, Romney, and when a line is coming down, it is favoring the Democrat, Obama. Kelly Odeboni of UC Berkeley replicated Clarkson's research and confirmed its accuracy, as you can see here in Figure 6a. There are some DREs, or direct recording electronic voting machines, in this election demonstrating a normal or relatively flat statistical pattern, but it would be ill-advised to conclude that those machines are secure. Based on conversations with security experts like Matt Bishop at UC Davis and Halderman at the University of Michigan, it is almost always possible to breach the security of these machines. After hacking the Washington, D.C. Internet Voting Pilot Program, Halderman said, If this particular problem had not existed, I'm confident that we would have found another way to attack the system. Columbia University political scientist Mark Lindemann and data scientist Levi Bowles have both published work confirming the existence of the pattern, but arguing that it is not indicative of fraud. We found their research flawed and their logic unconvincing, and have provided a detailed breakdown of these issues later in this paper. One fact that is clear from all these studies is that in many U.S. elections, certain candidates are receiving an increased share of the vote as the precincts get larger. The crucial question is, why? Is there an innocuous demographic explanation for the increase, or is it something that is indicative of error or fraud? When did the pattern begin? We're unable to pin down exactly when the pattern originated. In a fascinating trip down election fraud memory lane, writer Victoria Collier describes numerous troubled U.S. elections. It would be instructive to do a statistical analysis on one of the races that she cites as an upset, like Chuck Hagel's 1996 Nebraska Senate victory. Three days before the election, a poll conducted by the Omaha World Herald showed a dead heat. Hagel trounced Nelson by 15 points, Collier says. This divergence from pre-election polling was enough to raise eyebrows across the nation. For now, we can state that races we examined from 2004 and earlier did not show the pattern of increased candidates' percentages in large precincts. Looking again at Figure 4, we see that in the 2000 and 2004 races in Alachua, Florida, each candidate's share of the votes is roughly the same in small and large precincts. However, by 2008, this is not the case in many races around the country, as we can see in Figure 7. In the New Hampshire and Minnesota Democratic primaries, as well as in other races in 2008, candidates receive a larger percentage of the votes as the precincts get larger. In New Hampshire, the pattern benefits Clinton. In Minnesota, Obama is the one who gains vote shares in the large precincts. The 2008 New Hampshire Democratic presidential primary was also the race we looked at initially, where the manual recount did not match the original machine totals. Figure 8 shows the Wisconsin Republican primary in two different election cycles. In 2000, no candidate has much of an increase in the large precincts. But in 2016, Ted Cruz's percentage noticeably increases in the large precincts, while Donald Trump's percentage of the vote goes down. These two comparisons also demonstrate that the pattern is happening in both Democratic and Republican races. Doing further research on historical races will help identify possible early appearances of the pattern. Collier says, throughout the 1980s and 1990s, the use of optical scanners to process paper ballots became widespread. But perhaps the most seminal year for electronic voting equipment was 2002 when states across the country experienced a large influx of computer-based voting systems with the passage of the, perhaps ironically named, Help America Vote Act. 
Figure 9 shows a graph of the 2016 Louisiana Democratic primary. The analysis is by Beth Clarkson and Anselmo Sampietro confirmed its accuracy. This graph is in complete violation of the law of large numbers. For a candidate to receive this level of increased support in the large precincts, each new precinct must be so heavily weighted that it defies the average of all the other precincts that have already been added together. This is a major statistical irregularity. In the small precincts, the difference between Clinton and Sanders is approximately 10 percent, Clinton 48 to Sanders 38. However, in the largest precincts, the difference between the candidates is 47 percent, Clinton 70 to Sanders 23. That is a difference of 37 percent support between the smallest precincts and the largest precincts. To see how heavily weighted the large precincts are, we graph them separately, county by county, dividing the largest 25 percent from the remaining 75 percent, as you can see in figure 10. Within almost every county, Clinton receives a higher percentage of the vote in large precincts by unusually high margins, sometimes by close to 40 percent. In Washington County, you can literally see the moment that the data starts to change around 600 votes. There are three other characteristics of this data that are suspect. One, the data is smooth. The lines in the overall state chart go straight up and straight down, and lines of data in the large precincts are also quite straight. This is what Dr. Scheuren is referring to in the opening of the paper when he says, there is a greater degree of smoothness in the outcomes than the roughness that is typical in raw or real data. Two, the data is unidirectional. In the statewide results, the data only moves in one direction. Clinton goes up, Sanders goes down. The percentages never demonstrate the kind of ups and downs caused by organic voting behavior. Three, the data follows a mathematically predictable pattern. Clinton's support is increasing in a mathematically predictable way. In each progressively larger precinct, she gets a slightly larger level of support. This is a possible indication that a mathematical algorithm has been applied to the results. Okay, folks, that's the first half hour of this excellent paper. I urge you to finish reading it by following the links in the video description below. Thanks for listening.